City volunteers provide support to affected families after a fire broke out at a nursing home in New Taipei City. We take a look at how Taiwan's high-speed rail personnel work to ensure passenger safety. Welcome to Die Headlines. I'm Siri Su. Thank you for joining us. In South Africa, the dear volunteers in Johannesburg travel north to hold three rice distributions in Limpopo, the northernmost province. The residents became aware of Tsiji after one local volunteer began providing food for people in need there in 2014. This time around, the recipients of this aid from Taiwan expressed their gratitude in a very special way. In South Africa, the dear volunteers in Johannesburg, Hauteng, travel for 450 kilometers to reach the northernmost Limpopo province to hold three rice distributions. We want to thank the volunteers in Johannesburg for bringing rice to help us. Thanks to the volunteer Macy from Limpopo, Tsiji has decided to hold rice distributions here. Returning to her hometown after retirement in 2014, she was determined to help deliver rice from Taiwan into the hands of people in need. Thank you. Other families who are very much poor, what it did is very great. We thank you very much for that. Such as three rice distributions in Limpopo benefit 300 students at two elementary schools, along with 50 impoverished families. Every child receives two bags of rice and stationery, while each household also gets rice and a set of soap. Thank you for coming all the way from Johannesburg to help out. The rice will be a great help to these families. At the distribution at Molotodi Primary School, parents dressed up for the occasion. And children created a song to express their gratitude for the volunteers. Thank you for the things that you have done. It really means the whole world to us. It really means the whole world to us. The villagers in the mountainous areas cherish the gifts from Taiwan. Seeing their smiles, volunteers from Johannesburg know that their efforts have not been in vain. In Taiwan, early Wednesday morning, a fire broke out at a nursing home in Xindian, New Taipei City. At the time, 42 people were trapped in the nursing home. Most of the elderly residents were rescued, but six did not survive. 28 patients are still in the hospital, while eight seniors who were not injured have been transferred to a nearby nursing center. The cause of the fire, although still under investigation, is thought to have been caused by faulty wiring in electrical equipment. Firefighters quickly transport these survivors into an ambulance. On July 6th, around 7 in the morning, a fire broke out at a nursing home on Zhongzhen Road in New Taipei City's Xindian. At the time, 42 seniors and caregivers were trapped. When firefighters arrived at the scene, they discovered three bodies at the fire's origin. Later, 31 seniors were rescued, and among them, three who were sent to the hospital still couldn't recover and passed away. For the seniors who escaped on their own, they were still given quite a fright. There was a burnt smell, and then smoke came out of the room. The seniors couldn't move on their own, and their doors were locked. We left for safety. We don't know what happened inside. In room number five, where the three seniors were found, our initial assessment is that the fire started from electrical equipment. As for how or why, we are still investigating. This nursing center had just updated their fire safety code on April 21st. The 17 staff members, including persons in charge, as well as caregivers of the organization, are also fully licensed. Was the tragedy further exacerbated by the simple fact it occurred while the staff shifted from the night shift to the morning shift? For regulated nursing homes, in the daytime, it's one person to every eight patients, while at night the ratio is 1 to 25. For long-term care, the day shift is 1 to 5, while night shift is 1 to 15. We will check into whether the place operated according to these rules. To meet regulations, this particular nursing center needs at least three caregivers and nursing staff to be present during both the night and morning shift. As for the true cause of the fire, investigators are still looking into the matter. After the nursing home fire occurred in Xindian, near the Taipei City Hospital, city volunteers set up a care center offering water and snacks to the rescue workers as well as comforting the family members awaiting news of their loved ones. 
Here in Xinjiang's nursing center where the fire occurred, rescue workers continue to send the seniors to safety of the Taipei City Hospital. There was one senior that looked pale, who might have been having heart problems. The others we could inquire to see if they were maybe having trouble breathing or other physical issues. We are also concerned about smoke inhalation. City volunteers also mobilized their disaster relief efforts and prepared water and snacks for the rescue workers. The Jinsu Hall is located here, so we will be providing meals in a short while. We also have volunteers on hand to comfort. If someone comes out, we go ask if they need anything. One of our volunteers even went to the school where the survivor has been sent to look after the senior. We have divided up our manpower. You have provided assistance to many rescue workers as well as the staff here. The family members have been very frantic this entire time. Of course, we need to take care of them and ease their minds. I'm very thankful for the city volunteers for their help in this disaster. Offering their shoulder for the family members to lean on in this time of uncertainty, city volunteers plan to be there for the victims for as long as needed. In celebration of Hualien City Hospital's 30th anniversary, the hospital organized a cycling team who traveled to different city hospitals to deliver invitation cards for the anniversary celebration. Despite all the obstacles along the journey, the riders successfully completed their mission. Hualien City Hospital cycling team has traveled from eastern to western Taiwan to carry out an important mission, delivering invitation cards for the hospital's 30th anniversary celebration to different city hospitals. The team reaches Daling City Hospital on July 5th, where they are welcomed by the hospital staff who prepare herbal tea for them. We know that this herbal drink quenches thirst and benefits one's health, according to Chinese medicine. We serve it in the hot weather to welcome the riders who have reached Dalian Ziji Hospital. Hualien Ziji Hospital's island-wide bike ride is disrupted by Typhoon Apartheid. Out of concern for safety, the riders take the bus to reach Taichung City on July 6th. Then, joined by riders from Taichung City Hospital, they continue their symbolic bike trek from Hospital Zone 2 to Hospital Zone 1. Moving forward, despite obstacles, I believe such passion will unite the six Ziji hospitals to work together to carry out Ziji's medical mission. The superintendent of Taichung City Hospital receives the invitation card and signs on the flag. Due to the threat of typhoon, the seven-day ride has been changed to a five-day trip, with the riders reaching Taipei City Hospital earlier than scheduled. Taipei City Hospital Superintendent Dr. Zhao Youchen leads the medical staff and volunteers to welcome the cycling team as they arrive. After exchanging gifts and best wishes, the superintendent signs his signature. The weather has been extremely hot in the past few days. On the third day, when we are on the South Link Highway, there is a strong wind with temperatures as high as 40 degrees Celsius, if I remember it correctly. Despite the hot weather during the five-day ride, thanks to their training, the riders are able to persevere and complete the mission, uniting the staff of different city hospitals through their efforts. In China, Jiangsu Province, Funing County, was devastated by a recent tornado. City volunteers sprang into action to help affected residents. Now, the third team of volunteers is undertaking follow-up visits to temporary settlements and hospitals, while also going into affected areas to collect recyclables. Ziji volunteers took advantage of the fine weather to visit 82-year-old Grandpa Kong Qingling, whose house has been badly damaged by the tornado. While caring for victims is very important, these volunteers all carry bags as they are tending to yet another important task. In addition to visiting these different hospitals and those in the affected villages, we are also doing some recycling work to help clean the earth. 
Seeing these volunteers pick up recyclables, this elderly man, Kong Xian Cheng, hurriedly comes out with a bag of plastic items, and volunteers make use of this opportunity to educate him. After suffering this natural disaster, villagers in Funing County are being exposed to more care and compassion from others. They are also getting an introduction to the important lesson of recycling. Taiwan's high-speed rail is the country's fastest means of transportation between Taipei and Kaohsiung. In today's piece, we'll take a look at how HSR maintenance personnel ensure safety on the tracks and also how train operators prepare for emergency situations. These operators take simulated tests to prepare them for emergencies, like encountering a person on the tracks. In order to prepare train operators for some of the possible problems they may face, the high-speed rail has invested over 3 million U.S. dollars in a train-run simulator. Drivers must spend a thousand hours in the simulator before they receive their certification as HSR conductors. Okay. Permit speed. For clear. With all the classes together, including the simulator and practice on the actual trains, the training will probably take over eight months. This is how we find suitable candidates to be HSR operators. We aim to prepare them for rapid response in a relatively short amount of time. They need to keep critical judgment. With their eyes peeled and their ears open, operators must keep a cool head. In 2010, the Jiaxian earthquake caused an HSR train to derail and forced the suspension of six others on the tracks. Lin Hongguan was operating one of the trains. Thanks to his training and his calmness in the face of serious psychological pressure, there were no injuries among passengers. Sometimes you dream about stuff happening, like suddenly you have an obstruction on the tracks. You have to determine where it is, how far, and you have no way to determine in that instant how your response will affect other trains or what kind of damage it will do to the company. These kinds of things also pop up in your dreams. Sometimes these dreams wake you up in the middle of the night. As the fastest method of transportation in Taiwan, the threat of earthquakes is a serious consideration. This is the HSR Emergency Response Center in Taoyuan, where safety is always first priority. This wall displays the train lines and all trains in operation. At the other end, there are status displays for every train station with remote access to master controls. <laughs> As soon as our seismic detectors receive a signal that a quake has reached a rate of acceleration over 40 gal, then all trains will receive notification that they are over speed. Our automatic control systems will kick in and begin emergency deceleration. For trains that are en route, they will be forced to a stop according to SOP. Then we will send out manual patrols to the train on the tracks. These are emergency service personnel. Their work requires them to climb to reach the trains, which are always at least five to six meters off the ground. We may have to climb as high as seven or eight meters to do our work. All of the equipment we need to work with is on the top side of the trains. So some of our colleagues and some from other departments call us the Spider-Man of the HSR. With a power cable conveying 25,000 volts of electricity just above their heads as they work, saying service personnel must be careful in their work is stating it lightly. It is absolutely crucial they check and double check every move they make. The safety helmets with detection units continuously ring while in proximity to electricity. Written on the helmets, you can see their name as well as their blood type, just in case an accident occurs, so that medical treatment can be delivered as quickly as possible. I always thought my wife and my child would be unhappy with me choosing this line of work, 
but actually they have stood by me and encouraged me. I really appreciate their support. Every day that we finish work and can make sure that train 700T is running smoothly and ready for operation at 6 in the morning the following day, we go home with a genuine sense of accomplishment. For every HSR train that safely reaches its destination on time, behind the scenes is a team of unsung heroes who give their all every day to ensure the safety of HSR passengers. In recent years, philanthropic issues have been frequently discussed between charity groups, scholars and experts from Taiwan, China, Hong Kong and Macau. This year, a philanthropy symposium was held in Hong Kong on July 5th and 6th with many groups sharing their charity work. 2016 Crow Strait Hong Kong and Macau Philanthropy Symposium took place in Hong Kong on July 5th and 6th. More than 300 people, including representatives of charity organizations, experts and scholars, gathered to discuss this issue of charity mission development. Welfare service in the Chinese community has been well developed, while on the other hand, it has many Chinese characteristics in it, since there are different backgrounds and histories among four regions of the Cross Straits. We hope to make a further cultural exchange through the forum. Charity has the power to change the world. As an event organizer, Ji Foundation shared its interracial and interreligious charity work. Buddhists promote unconditional kindness and universal compassion, while Confucianism advocates kind-heartedness. So we should start from our heart, from true love, and from compassion for others. In this way, this charity will be relied on, be integrated, and be well-developed. We offer a variety of services which have met the needs of disaster areas all over the world. This good deed helps the attendees know more about Siji. We need to take more responsibility for helping others since having received more recognition from the society. This forum features issues on sharing, shouldering and creating, which fosters discussion and experience exchange through different projects. In the beginning, Ziji was established on word of mouth. However, after establishing a non-profit organization, honesty becomes very important. Everyone pays much attention on the foundation's engagement. Assistance occurs only when the foundation devotes itself to the right things. Since each organization shares and exchanges their experiences on charity work, it is believed that humanitarian aids will be more efficient. To welcome Eid El Fatir, City Volunteers in Malacca, Malaysia, visited Muslim aid recipients and scholarship recipients with gifts. In one family, a woman's husband passed away, and her two children were sent back to Indonesia, leaving her feeling depressed. Fortunately, City Volunteers helped comfort this woman during their visit. <laughs> to welcome Eid El Fatir, Tsiji Volunteers in Malacca, visit Muslim care recipients and Tsiji scholarship recipients and give them 92 presents. I like your gifts. Thank you very much. <laughs> this day is Eid El Fitur, but Nanik and her son are not in a happy mood. You must support your mom because there are only the two of you in Malaysia. Nanik's husband passed away and her two children were dispatched back to Indonesia. So this family cannot have a family reunion, but Tsiji volunteers came to bring them blessing. I treat volunteers as my brothers and sisters because they come to help me every month. They also gave some presents this time, so I want to thank them. At least we can help her and reduce her pain, so she won't be so sad. Is the food okay with you? If not, you can tell us, and we'll give you different ones. By giving Muslim blessing, what Tsiji volunteers do is overcoming racial boundaries and creating harmony among them. We continue to look at how low birth rates in Taiwan affect enrollment at local elementary schools. Penghu County merged three elementary schools this year. Ten years ago, it decommissioned Da Chang Elementary School. After that, students face a more arduous trip to school. The 
I get up at 6.30 a.m. and then taking a 15-20 minute boat trip and then another five minute ride to take me to Makong Elementary School. Fourth grade student Xiao Tong attends Makong Elementary. He is very lively, does his homework well, and enjoys going to school. Besides typhoon days, I am always happy to come to school, regardless of the weather, to be with my classmates, because being at home is very boring. Actually, this child from Da Chang Elementary studies really hard, despite the difficulty he encounters. He gets to school every day around 6.40 to 6.50 in the morning. So he's the first to arrive at the school, and he opens the door to the class. Originally, many thought that getting up early every day and commuting by boat would be physically taxing for these kids and would affect their studies, but Xiao Tong completely surprised everyone. He's the best in class when it comes to his coursework in class, and he really likes to go outside to play with other children or run around. He doesn't spend too much time in the classroom because he loves nature. Like all children, when class has ended, Xiao Tong is anxious to go to the school playground. He's very good at basketball, and he's always first when it comes to running, and he's quite strong. Judging by his body, you can't tell that he's a student that needs to commute a long distance to get to school each day. I think his interest in school is different from us. He said that from a young age, he was on a boat and developed left and right and forward and back balances. So he thinks his body is quite okay. When school ends for the day, he goes to the main gate to wait for a taxi. That takes him to the harbor where he boards a boat captained by his father, who waits for him every day. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? As long as the ocean is safe, his father operates his boat and takes him back and forth to school. Despite the hardship, there's also some joy. This child says that his father's advice about overcoming hardship has been his greatest inspiration. The way they go to school is different from others, as other students don't need to get up half an hour early. He needs to get up half an hour early, otherwise he will be late. But you can also say he has an extra 30 minutes of his life every day. This shows that merging schools may not be a bad thing if enough supporting measures are first put into place. Da Sang Elementary was decommissioned in 2005, with such students being given access to a scheduled boat trip every day, along with overland transportation, along with assurances that their travel is safe. After returning home, these rural children still have a number of things to accomplish. While there is no school on the island, this hasn't stopped their pursuit of knowledge, as their hardships may even teach them more about society and help them develop a strong and optimistic personality trait. The closing of their school may have just opened up much broader horizons for them. As Typhoon Napartic approaches Taiwan, city volunteers in northern Taiwan have been visiting care recipients to ensure people are taking precautions to reduce the impact of the typhoon. Thank you for joining us. Please stay safe and do all related preparations to minimize the impact of typhoon. Goodbye.